Welcome, everyone. This week, we are discussing allergies. And so we have invited some of our favorite friends to talk about allergies with us. And today, we are lucky enough to have Dr. Peter Tobias coming from one of his many homes around the world. Um, <laughs> we're always trying to track him down. <laughs> And that is that is not exactly true. <laughs> it's but it's I, more complicated. It's more complicated. Life takes you to different places for different reasons, family and uh, and partners and so on. So it just kind of happens that I don't have the liberty of choosing <laughs> one place, which actually in my heart I would do in <laughs> no time. So that's just how it is. It's um, just more fun, and I, and I have to commend you because. <laughs> One of your homes or places where you spend a lot of time is in Hawaii, and you just got back from going to Maui to, um, you know, kind of lend a hand and see what was going on. And um, all of us who are not able to go do that, we really appreciate uh, your time and efforts um, on the ground. So thank you very much for that. It's thank you. Yeah, it uh, it has been really hard for the local community. We've been working with the Hawaii Animal. Rescue Foundation, which is an amazing organization that has been homing animals that basically were left homeless with the families. And uh, so a lot of different uh, different efforts. Uh, they educate people and, and, you know, and also definitely have participated in the rescue efforts. Uh, I have been in touch with them. Uh, we've been able to collect significant amount of money for, for the community. But, you know, uh, Judy, the trauma of the community is so big that um, when you're in the middle of it, and I arrived accidentally just a day before it all happened, um, when you're in the middle of it, you feel like you want to do something because just being there, doing nothing, just didn't feel like an option. Right. And um, there were a lot of people who were helping on the ground, but the, the funds and the money were the most important part. So we try to kind of help, you know, in the humane society and, and, and other places, but there are volunteers everywhere. But what Great. Hawaiians need now and Maui people need right now is funds and also tourists coming back slowly and gradually because 90% of the island is dependent on, yeah. on uh, tourists. So, yeah. you know, a small portion of the island has been obviously decimated and it's been really heartbreaking and I can't really talk about it very easily. Yeah. Uh, but um, now the next phase is to make sure that people understand that not coming at all is actually going to put the island into more distress. So that's just how I see it. It may be a different opinion. Some people may have a different opinion, but I think that locals now realize that cutting off the tourism completely is not a solution either. So there has to be yeah. balanced, like everything, right? Like we try to yeah. be in the in the middle, in the center. <laughs> Figure, yeah, I, I think after a little bit of recuperation time that it, it needs to blossom into what it has been for so long, because that is what supports the people on that island. So I totally get that. You know, I, I know there's a couple of um, large corporate ventures there, but that is not what supports the local people. So <clears throat> no, and you know, out. it's it's hard to criticize from the outside. You know, I'm, I, I've been I've been kind of a part-time Maui resident since 2008. And uh, and the community is lovely, amazing, but there are also some things that kind of haven't evolved, right? The infrastructure has not evolved, uh, the emergency yeah. situation, you know, and, and the, the, the the warning systems and so on. Like, we you know, all know that. But let's um, let, let's move on. If anyone anyway. wants to donate to the fund, the, the fund it's still on GoFundMe. Uh, we'll be uh, working with the Hawaii Animal Rescue Foundation for many months and hopefully years great. to come. And so if anyone great. wants to donate, great. Thank you. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Okay. So we want to talk allergies. Um, and as holistic veterinarians, we all kind of have our different thought processes and different favorite things that we do first. So I'm going to give you a, uh, a just a, you know, Client calls you and says, or comes in your office, and they've got a two-year-old French bulldog with no hair, itchy, hives, broken out, been on lots of antibiotics. What's the 
first thing, and let me, let me, French, I started with a French bulldog, which I never should go there because as cute and wonderful as they are, oh my gosh, they're like an allergy just looking to be born. So, yeah. but what's the first thing that you tell, I mean, we sort of have like a, a six step process of, all right, you got, you definitely got to do this. And then you definitely got to look at this. Uh, like, what, are the, what are your first steps that you tell people? Oh like goodness. I've got this horrible itchy allergy dog. What would you do? Uh, you know, I've had many of those. We all have yeah. many of had <laughs> many of those. <laughs> and the first thing that we do is just to take a deep breath, right? Because you know that uh, people have been to many others that they've tried to solve the problem, that most of these dogs are not only uncomfortable, which is really heartbreaking, but they also are on a lot of drugs, uh, a lot of immunosuppressive drugs, on a lot of antibiotics and so on. So, you know, I have um, relatively... Uh, a good ability to kind of step step away. So I call it zoom out, right? Zoom out and just kind of see how I can prioritize the different things uh, that I need to do. And then also how I can bring people on board and make them comfortable with what, I, what I'm suggesting, make them trust me. So initially, you know, obviously you say hi to the dog and have a little cuddle and, and just kind of like, you know, also have that kind of connection. But second, um, you have to, you really have to zoom out and step out. And um, I think what often happens, people get really easily overwhelmed. So sometimes I'm almost embarrassed how simplistic my approach to health and medicine is. And it actually started many, many, many uh, years back when I used to have allergies and I was actually one of those puppies in a way <laughs> who was on, uh, on the suppressive medications and antihistamines and, and, and different, you know, different uh, pharmaceuticals. And so I, I kind of have had the first hand experience what it is to be allergic and, uh, and then what it is, what, how, how to solve it. So when I start working with my clients, uh, obviously, we need to start with the building blocks. But we need to start with just kind of inquiring what they've been doing. Uh, most dogs are on hypoallergenic diets. They are nowhere close to a species-appropriate diet, and you've seen right. that too. Uh, most dogs have been uh, on, as I said, antihistamines or steroids or immunosuppressive drugs of different kinds. They're, you know, they're evolving as we progress in, in medicine, yes. right? If we sure. can call it progress. <laughs> yeah. um, and so um, it's super important for us to not to not to make anyone feel guilty. And I think oh, it's also absolutely. important not to really talk negative terms about our colleagues because we all try to do our best. Right. And it's only a matter of time when we realize that what we are doing in conventional medicine is not working or working very poorly. And then you have to go back to the basics. So going to the basics, I would definitely start with diet. Because number one thing that we know now is that the immune system actually is closely connected to the gut. And if the gut is inflamed or not in ideal condition, then allergies are more likely to happen. I, once again, my personal experience has been when, when, when I was growing up, like I was, I was really unhealthy. I, I was eating sugar. I was eating, you know, a lot of dairy and, and, and a lot of um, aggravating foods. Um, and as a result, I had hay fever six months out of the year and I couldn't really breathe through my nose. So diet, diet is super important. Um, you know, I always kind of brace myself for that. Okay. You can't really stop. We, we, we can't really continue feeding kibble. I have to say that to my clients. And again, that, that has to be gradually introduced, right? Yeah. Um, well, particularly when all they've heard is you have to feed this hypoallergenic kibble. And uh, interestingly, going to dermatology lectures at big vet conferences, even the dermatologists will say, well, they only work 50 percent of the time. And they're yes. they're not they're really not geared to be fed long term. They're supposed to be a short term while you're fixing things and they end up being prescribed lifelong, which is just <laughs> very wrong. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, if you look at the, the consequences of these diets, I mean, you know, the, the first thing that you need to do is to look at the label and you see that they're, they're nowhere close to species appropriate diets. So again, uh, you know, when I deal with allergies, I always try to tell my clients that they have to go back to nature, back to nature, see what nature does. Meaning that, uh, 
and I stopped my uh, phone and I said, do not disturb to my phone. And it's still, <laughs> <laughs> it's still Plus, disturbing. <laughs> this is actually even, this is even better that my dog, Pat, when he hears a certain type of ring, he starts howling. <laughs> so now we have howling on top of that. <laughs> it's perfect. It's perfect. <laughs> this is this is like a perfect broadcast. <laughs> so we were talking species appropriate diets. Um, obviously, there are different different versions and varieties and opinions. But when you go to back to either cooked or raw diet, I prefer raw diet. But some people don't like to feed raw. Uh, the immune system will calm down uh, if you if you feed uh, proteins that are that are close to the natural original format, then the body just basically calms down. Obviously, it's much more complex because some dogs may react to certain proteins and others are fine. So it's a little bit of trial and error uh, on that right. level. Uh, we can also use testing that will give us some sort of idea whether we should or should not feed. But you and I know that testing is not always accurate. Right. It's not, I, it's I, not I always think- Take it with a grain of salt. It, exactly. You know, it, exactly. I saw one the other day that came in and, you know, anything um, that the pet was not allergic to was supposed to be under 100. And under beef, it was like 814. I said, I'd probably avoid that. Yes, <laughs> like, yes, yes. That exactly. was screaming at you. <laughs> exactly. So, so uh, obviously, diet is one of the most important parts. And, um, you know, I always say nobody tries to build a house without the building blocks. Nobody tries to maintain the house without having the, having all the systems functioning but our body our body is often neglected and our dog's bodies are often neglected to the point of um, ignoring the fact that nutrients and nutrition is not what it used to be so when we want the body to function in a an ideal kind of harmony uh, then we need to make sure that the nutrients will be there. And again, everyone has different opinions. I just have a very simple approach to allergies where I just basically try to uh, try to introduce them to raw diet. Uh, also just kind of address, and you're very good in, in addressing the, the, the metabolic types and, uh, and, and see whether dogs are overheating or whether they're cooling and so on and, 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 and decide what foods are better than others. Um, and uh, I know that you wrote a book on that, so I'm not going to be going too much into detail, even though I definitely, if I, you know, if I ask people whether their dog is too hot or too cold, then I decide what proteins I'm going to give. Exactly. Interestingly enough, my two dogs, Sky and Pax, were complete opposite. Uh, Sky <laughs> was a chili dog, uh, hence he was doing better on poultry. Pax is a hot dog. He's not doing well on poultry at all, for example, right? Yep. So I, I totally agree with you that it applies yeah. beautifully. So, yeah, I mean, using that energetics kind of gives you a starting point. And something mm-hmm. else that uh, I used to talk about more and I don't talk about as often, but look at your breed of dog and where do they originate? So if you have like an Alaskan breed, then what would they be fed there? If you have mm-hmm. a dog that originated in England, what do they feed? They feed lamb and they feed fish. Um, so if you look at what their origins would say, this is what my genetics were mm-hmm. raised on. Mm-hmm. Sometimes that can kind of lead you. And we, I don't talk about that very often because I head right into the energetics, but sometimes um, looking at historic origins can be helpful as well. That makes really that makes a lot of sense. Uh, definitely, definitely. And there are certain breeds that you know are going to be more hot, like labs are more hot, right? Like labs are <laughs> Labrador Retriever from Labrador, right? So, <laughs> yeah. so that 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 makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, so so when it comes to when it comes to that in the first phase, it's relatively easy. Um, you know, natural diet, essential nutrients like omegas, probiotics, vitamins, and and minerals, and uh, making sure that the body does have the building block because there's 37,000 billion, billion chemical reactions happening in the body every second. So that's like an amazing, amazing number. Nobody can imagine It's kind that. of amazing that it, it all meshes and does That it all meshes, no right? Like this it. is the, <laughs> and without anyone's control. And this is, this is the other beautiful part that, you know, most things in nature, even though they seem to be complex, they work on their own. Hence, we just have to prevent the obstructions to cure, prevent the obstructions of, um, of 
medicine or nutrition or whatever else in the environment, uh, we have to prevent them from happening and or or protect the, our dogs from from being affected or influenced by them, and then they actually go back to normal. Uh, but there is also, uh, you know, when when the first phase is over, many dogs will improve. Obviously, we need to test for different medical conditions like Cushing's disease or hypothyroidism and so on. Uh, mites, uh, parasites, fleas, all those can actually be aggravating. But many dogs actually, when you basically switch them to natural food, to raw food or cooked food, they just improve so dramatically that yeah. um, there's nothing else needed to be done. <laughs> I have one story. I love those. I love the ones that do that flip because it's like, man, I'm a genius. <laughs> I just worked magic. Then you get the others and it's like, nah, it's not working. <laughs> yeah, that's the that's the that's the humbling part, right? And I think that we do need to be humbled once in a while because uh, otherwise we are, you know, we can't. <laughs> we, yeah. Otherwise, it looks too easy and nobody. Our needs ego, to, no. our ego. Even though we try to keep it in check, I think that we all like to be uh, good in what we do. And so it's just, uh, yeah, it's, um, it, we have to be adult enough, mature, grown up enough. <laughs> but I think we also have to look at how long has the problem been going on mm -hmm. and how much has already been thrown at that dog. <laughs> exactly. Um, so for instance, when I learned TCVM, we were taught that, look, if this dog's allergy problems have been going on for two years, they can expect up to double that length of time to totally get this reversed because by the time you, because you've got to detox all that stuff that's been there, that's been done to them, that's destroyed their microbiome, that's destroyed their immune system in most cases, because they're allergy dogs. What are they given? Mm -hmm. Huge doses of immunosuppressive drugs. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I had one little dog that came to me for three years. She had been on Apoquel and she had been getting Cytopoint injections every month for three years. And this dog did not have a hair on her body and was bright red, broken out, raw, red, yep. oozing. And this is kind of one of those where I'm like, yeah, isn't this the definition of insanity? They've been doing the same thing for three years and it's just not working. Like <laughs> They're expecting a different result. It's like, so yeah. we have to reverse all of that, which is not an overnight process, unfortunately. It is not. And, you know, um, there, there's another point of view and and i think that it's super important for everyone to know that uh if you start using immunosuppressive drugs some of these animals actually lose the ability to recover uh, it's almost like they're broken beyond the point of repair so it's super important for people to understand that immunosuppressive drugs are not the way to treat allergies that we actually will damage the immune system that the immune system loses the ability to respond I always, you know, I, I sometimes compare it to a situation where you have a bank card and you try to get get money out of the bank machine, and you take the magnetic strip and you scratch it over and you, you know, and you put toothpaste on it and then you try to put it in the bank machine, and it doesn't reach, right? And that's the same thing that we can actually have treatments that are normally effective, but when you use immunosuppressive drugs like steroids, uh, dexamethasone, prednisone, and so on, and citopoint and and other treatments. Uh, it will um, it will possibly damage the immune system to the point where it either takes very long time, as you say, double the amount of time, as uh, you know, from from the time the condition started. Let's say if we have two years, we have four years of maybe treatment, um, and sometimes they may not recover. But there's another really important part of allergies that I find is not discussed enough, and. I'm sure that there's many colleagues who talk about, you know, even holistic colleagues and convention, conventionally minded colleagues, um, how to treat allergies more mindfully without the use of immunosuppressive drugs. But I dare to say that uh, a big chunk of the conditions that are labeled al as allergies are not allergies. And I really would love to talk about them today as well, because uh, that's something that um, that really is not discuss often enough and I think often missed. So if it's okay, we can dive yeah, into that absolutely. area. Yeah, absolutely. So I will start us off on that because as you know, I have Cavalier King Charles Spaniels and English Toy Spaniels. Mm -hmm. And something like over 90% of them have caudal occipital malformation syndrome and syringomyelia. What is the main symptom of those diseases? Air scratching. So what do they do? 
They scratch. Yes. It might be their neck. Yes. They might. Sh- I have one who chews on his loins. Uh, I had one client. Their only symptom was the dog scooted on its butt all the time. And I can't tell you how many of these breeds that actually have a neurologic condition are being treated for allergies that they don't have. So that is one. Uh, you alluded to a couple earlier on endocrine diseases that we definitely need to throw in that category, the thyroid, the Cushing's disease, they're chronically breaking out. Mm -hmm. And it's not that they have allergies, they're itching because they've got bacterial infection in their skin that is making nuts or yeast infections. Absolutely. Absolutely. What else do you want to throw in that pot? Well, you know, uh, I'm I'm really glad that you're talking about the neurological discomfort and uh, some sort of form of physical discomfort, like uh, so many dogs lick their paws, for example, or feet. And uh, they are often diagnosed with allergies. Um, that's just basically what we've been taught. Uh, unfortunately, uh, many of them have uh, injuries from collars or neck injuries from falling or slipping and sliding or tug of war, playing tug of war, mm-hmm. but mainly from collars because we know that uh, nerves that, um, that supply the front extremities, actually the forelegs, uh, originate from the neck. And um, many dogs pull on the leash. Many dogs are on retractable leashes that actually have these powerful breaks. So, you know, if a dog runs to say hi to another dog, they, they, you know, they, (laughs) so there's a, there's this big shock to the, to the system. And uh, not only that they feel abnormal sensation after, after a while, like we, if we have tight necks, sometimes we may Mm -hmm. feel tingling or something like that, or we may get tight in our muscles. Uh, uh, They... Yeah, it, it really affects them on that on the physical level. They start licking their feet and paws, uh, but even more so. And I'm I'm a big proponent of harnesses because there is the vagal nerve originates uh, in the neck and also the sympathetic nerves, uh, nerve fibers. And when dogs pull, these nerves are affected, and it can affect actually the internal organs, as we know, right? Uh, the vagus vagus supplies the heart and the lungs and the digestive tract and so on. So the neck is in my mind um, the governing area of the whole body when it comes to physical health and and metabolic health and so on. But, you know, going back to the allergies, definitely feet and paw licking is one of the most common ones. Um, Mm -hmm. Then spinal health. Um, Many dogs actually chew their abdomen or they chew their groin and so on. And again, that can be referred from the spinal nerves. Like I love, like the first thing that I do when I see a patient, I would examine their spine and go along the spine. And if there is a tendency to hot spots or if there's a tendency to abdominal licking, usually those segments that supply the those particular regions are affected. So, you know, when you have a dog that itches, it may be classified as allergies and misdiagnosed as allergies because uh, these dogs actually itch. They scratch their... They're, they're tight muscles, they chew their tight muscles, they may have normal sensation there. And weirdly enough, when these spinal segments are affected, you know, imagine a salmon or fish of any kind, you see the segments really nicely coming from the spine down, right? So our dogs have not as linear segments, but they're very similar. They go a little bit from a spinal segment, they go slightly back and down. So if you have a dog, a golden retriever that has uh, hot spots in the abdomen or in the groin, quite often they have actually really misaligned and influenced spinal segments that relate to that particular area. So that's something Absolutely. that uh, that you know is still not addressed fully. Um, frequently, it's missed, um, and I think that we as veterinarians really need to collaborate and work with people who have either education in spinal alignment or if, if veterinarians have uh, chiropractic um, uh, post post gradual exa- how do you call it post post gradual you know it's it is interesting because um it, you, when you see an allergy animal whipping out your chiropractic tools and knowledge is is not generally the first thing in your mind but i have a great story i had this little um so yeah Eskimo spitz mix little dog. She's like 35 pounds. And she had a really horrible lick granuloma on her Mm -hmm. knee. Mm -hmm. Just wouldn't leave it alone. Wouldn't leave it alone. Wouldn't leave it alone. And so I'm like, you know what? I think this dog's got tingling in this leg. She, you know, Mm -hmm. no arthritis on the x-rays. I'm like, she's got tingling. She's going after this for a reason. Mm -hmm. 
and I had just learned chiropractic. So I was like, you know what, can I, can I do a chiropractic adjustment on your dog? Let's just see if this has any effect on this. The owner was like, sure, do whatever you want. So I did an adjustment on the dog and had him come back the following week. And I said, so how's it been going? He said, well, not only is she not touched the leg, but the dog for the very first time in her life saw a bird fly over. Because she, he said, I didn't realize it until after she did it, is that she could never lift her head up. Exactly. Her head was always straight. Exactly. And after the adjustment, she looked up <laughs> and she saw birds fly over. And he said, I chased this dog around the yard for the entire week. All she wants to do is watch birds fly because she finally discovered that they exist and her leg healed. So <laughs> there's so much truth in this. And it's not something... That, so when I would see these lit granuloma, which basically is the same as a hot spot, somebody mm -hmm. reached mm -hmm. out to me not too long ago and said, we've got this hot spot that just won't heal, just won't heal, just mm -hmm. won't heal. I'm like, there's something mm -hmm. more going on. It's not just a hot spot. It's not just an allergy. It's the same spot and it's not getting better no matter what you put on it, no matter what you give the dog. You better look somewhere else. What is leading into that area? Let's look at nerve issues. Let's look at, you know, something else that's causing an issue. So I think, I, I think you're definitely onto something that we don't pay enough attention to well obviously you do because you, you understand it you know it but i think that as a I, I i would dare to say that it's still not taught at most veterinary colleges uh that that you know hot spots can be related to spinal misalignments or muscle injuries uh of any kind right. uh right. yeah ears are another you know ears are obviously they're part of the allergy complex and uh uh, that's another one, but I love treating ears because most of the time it's about management. And, you know, we've seen all these cocker spaniels that are just about to get their ear canal removed. And uh, I, ha I had one I had to have them both removed yeah, at the age so, of 16. So uh, I, I have a, I, I, you know, we can, uh, we, we could talk about ears as well. Um, if you want. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Um, I remember, especially one case, I, I can't remember the dog's name, but, uh, Vancouver clients, lovely clients have done pretty much everything. And so we sat down, uh, after they've been around maybe five or six different veterinary clinics and, and specialists and so on. And I first asked what they were doing with the, with the dog's ears, because ears are usually an expression of some sort of either obviously genetic predisposition. Uh, dietary imbalances, you know, there's always like what came first, the genes or the, the environmental influence, right? Like we know that they kind of go along. But anyway, this particular dog uh, was very much loved. And these people were cleaning his ears twice a day. And they were also washing his neck because he had this, you know, the, the lichenification the or the thicken, <laughs> and the yeast and the thickened skin and so on. Uh, so they were basically washing all this like every day. And I find that unless the ears are infected with, with some sort of aggressive bacteria like Pseudomonas or Klebsiella or something like that, I, or Proteus, um, I usually treat them by diet and by homeopathy and adjusting, you know, the spine and the neck and leave the ears alone unless there is infection and then in those situations sometimes for comfort we need to we need to use antibiotics but again addressing the addressing the antibiotic treatment with probiotics as well making sure we replenish the bacterial flora and you don't cause more damage but overall this particular dog um, has really improved only because these these clients these lovely people actually stopped cleaning and over cleaning the air canal right because the ear canal can be really overcleaned, and I know that sometimes in your oh, experience yeah. must be different. Because I know that you, you are aware of all these things. So I would be curious to actually know what's happened with your dog um, uh, and with the ears. So this, I, so I had a cocker that I adopted at age sixteen. I see, and he he came. Both eardrums were already ruptured. He had middle ear infections. He pus poured out of his yeah. ears and yeah. I worked on him for two years. We got nowhere. He finally had ear canal ablations at 16 yes. and lived to 18. So it was the thing to do for him. I have a new cocker who, you know, came with all the usual cocker, bad skin. Uh, he's a rescue, bad skin, bad ears, bad eyes. He was blind. We got one cataract taken out. The other one's not going to help. Um, his ears look great now. I switched him over to a raw diet at the beginning. He was like, I'm not eating this stuff. Are you crazy lady? <laughs> like, I, uh, 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 so we started off with, um, we were gently cooking his uh, his raw food, and he said, "Okay." And then one day, I was like, 
and, and I, it's so funny because at the beginning I was like, here, have a raw chicken heart. And he went, <laughs> like, I know exactly now this guy describing. oh my god he loves his raw food now he's the first one in line and his ears have cleared up so so he was easy yes but um one of the things and this kind of leads into the whole allergy thing one of the things that with the over cleaning it's just like over bathing yes the skin yes. and using things like chlorhexidine and these you know ketoconazole mm-hmm. shampoos mm-hmm. and all mm-hmm. we're destroying the microbiome the Absolutely. ears have a microbiome Absolutely. just like the skin just like the gut just like the lungs and when we're chronically putting stuff in there and then when depending on how you're cleaning the ears if you're using you know cotton swabs or pieces of gauze you're abrading mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. ear canal mm-hmm. which is very very sensitive tissue um and so you're just inviting things to jump in there and go hey and depending on what you're cleaning with if it's got a water base or a peroxide base you're leaving moisture in the ears which mm-hmm. is just inviting the mm-hmm. yeast to grow mm-hmm. if you're using an alcohol base then you're burning the ears and destroying the the ear lining so it's it's really critical that we don't overclean things it, it's sort of like all those studies that show children who grow up in houses where the people are germaphobes and everything is clean and there's no animals <laughs> in the house those kids have allergies for life. Meanwhile, my kids grew up in a barn. And they were eating, you know, sandwiches with dirty hands and like, they're great. Of course, you know, <laughs> they that, have a great immune system. <laughs> there was a German study done some time ago. And they basically, the conclusion was that if you move a cow, the farm kids are healthier, right? So the conclusion was if you move a cow in, the, in your living room, that, that that's the best way to stay healthy. <laughs> there you go. Get a cow. <laughs> but, you know, I think that it starts and this is the, this is the, this is the unfortunate thing that it starts with the perception that ears have to be clean, no matter whether they're healthy mm. or not. So many people actually take the solutions and they start washing out. And these solutions often are mildly bactericidal. So they actually kill the kind of beneficial bacteria. The good guys. And yeah. they actually will leave the space, the field open for the aggressive bacteria, pseudomonas, that is very painful, right? Uh, and that's what we've seen. Like, And then they're very difficult to treat. So I actually have a, an approach. If, if your dog doesn't bother his or her ears um, and there's a little bit of wax on the surface, maybe you can wipe it off once a month. But even more importantly, when there is a little bit of wax and, and a little bit of yeasty smell, just do a cleanse. Just make sure that your dog's diet is fine, that there is not starches and carbohydrates, that the microbiome is okay. And, and you know, we know that yeast actually is an opportunistic pathogen, right? Like it actually exists in harmony. And as soon as we, our metabolism or our dog's metabolism is off balance, then they start multiplying and causing serious problems. And that applies to dogs and humans as well. Yep. Um, yeah. So, yeah, exactly. So it really is about, you know, the, the overall, the global microbiome. We talk about the gut microbiome so much in reference to allergies mm-hmm. and leaky mm-hmm. gut. And yes, that's mm-hmm. a huge part of it. But unfortunately, a lot of the treatments that we use for these allergic pets are continuing to keep the snowball going. Yes. So, yes, uh, the, you know, all these chemical, and you know, chemical shampoos that have detergents mm-hmm. and you know, mm-hmm. sulfates mm-hmm. and things that are just really more damaging to the microbiome. And that like I have yet to see, I have yet to see a veterinary prescribed, not a holistic veterinarian, but a traditional veterinary prescribed pharmaceutically sponsored ear cleaner that doesn't have things like alcohol Mm -hmm. or dyes Mm -hmm. or chlorhexidine Mm -hmm. or ketoconazole or a steroid. Um, They've always got things in them that are upsetting things more than fixing things. Yeah. You know, the, 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 there's a, I I definitely agree that 80, 90% of these air conditions can be treated without any pharmaceuticals. I always kind of look at the comfort level, even though I used to be much more, black and white. Now I go, okay, if I have a Cocker Spaniel that comes at the age of 12 and has really horrible ears with uh, a very aggressive pathogen in the ear canal, I definitely never use the steroids. I would sometimes use the antifungals or antibiotics, but with the understanding that I have to stop as soon as possible and that I have to right. restore the right. dog's, uh, dog's balance. And the other thing right. that people often kind of miss out on is that 
allergies are not <laughs> they're basically a name for a, a symptom of, pro, of 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 group of problems but allergies right. are basically an immune system disease where the immune system freaks right. out and overreacts and we know two different modes of dysfunction of the immune system one of them is underreaction or kind of going to that depressed state which is often common in golden retrievers or the dogs that are less reactive and they often get cancer but the ones that are actually really hyper reactive and the immune system is feisty and overreacting uh those get allergies and it's almost like you know if you have too much work on your desk uh you either kind of fold yourself down and just kind of pretend that it doesn't exist or you overreact, right? So the immune system, when it's overwhelmed by toxins, the environment, stress, uh, bad diet, and so on, starts overreacting and, 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 and kind of reacting to food that it normally should tolerate. So that's, the, that's an exaggerated reaction. So our focus has to be on, on calming down the immune system, just making sure that that, 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 that settles down. And it just comes down to just good nutrition, like exercise, low stress, love, spinal alignment. Like it's so simple. <laughs> Sometimes it's so embarrassingly simple that I go like, oh my goodness, like <laughs> it should be more complicated. But we do make it more complicated in medicine, often for the sake of maybe maybe we just, you know, lose the lose the simple. The, the per simple perception and the common sense and try to make it more complex than it really is. Well, and in I most think, cases, not uh, all. I want to point I, out. And I think that um, for, for pet parents, uh, there's a lot of fear-based reaction as well. It's like, oh my gosh, he's starting to scratch. Next thing you know, he's going to have hot spots everywhere and he's going to be all broken out. And so I better jump on the antibiotics and the steroids mm -hmm. before we mm -hmm. get to that mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. um, and so, some, you know, we've just been so trained to here's a pill to fix it. And I think, you know, particularly if you have a, a pet with seasonal allergies, a lot of my patients that we knew had seasonal allergies. It's like, OK, well, we don't want to put them on all these drugs, so we need to start prepping ahead of time. Okay. We know they're going to start breaking out in April. Let's ramp up our quercetin. Let's ramp up our, um, our great windkeeper, the yes. Chinese. Yes. Let, let's just start. We start that ahead of time. Let's change the diet for the season, um, moving into it bef and try to head it off at mm -hmm. the pass because mm -hmm. it's so much easier mm -hmm. with anything in life to prevent it <sighs> than it is to catch the train that already left the station. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. so if you know that your pet has seasonal allergies, sort of trying to ramp up with, okay, what natural anti-inflammatories can I throw on board? And I know this is going to happen in the second week in April. I'm going to start jumping on this by the middle of March. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> and the other thing is that you can do liver cleanse and you can do adaptogens. You exactly. can do uh, sting nettle and all those ahead. But, you know, there is another really interesting part of this spring seasonal allergy that many dogs in, especially in some parts of Canada and the United States are quite inactive in uh, the winter. Oh, and they may actually aggravate their muscular skeletal injuries. So there is a, you know, uh, so there is like definitely seasonal allergies do, do happen and they exist and they're real. Uh, but once again, unless we address and just kind of do the comprehensive assessment in spring and say, okay, is my dog exercising more? And now it's chasing the ball like twice a day for 30 minutes and maybe it's got tightness in the lumbar area, right? So it's just, uh, and that's why it's true. I, I don't want to, yeah, I don't want to discount the, the, the immune, um, com, com, how do you say that? Um, the immune component of, uh, of the problem, but it can be something else as well. So just kind of keep your mind exactly. open. Um, exactly. And yeah. that's an interesting point yeah. because yeah. it is true, particularly if you have spring allergies in the summer, I look at it and I go, that's summer damp heat. That's just, you know, they got, they just got, especially here. It's so hot and humid. Last week it was 95 degrees mm -hmm. and 92% mm -hmm. humidity all mm -hmm. week. It's just like, okay, everybody's just got this heaviness and yes. you know, we yes. get, we get gooey sores because there's, you know, all this dampness and heaviness. Mm -hmm. Um, and so knowing when that's coming and knowing how to deal with that with food or herbs or, you know, things to try to calm that down as well. So, um, 
a lot of stuff we can do. And you know, all right. Uh, I, I just wanted to say I really appreciate your Chinese medicine out, outlook. Even though I don't really, <laughs> I I don't have a background in Chinese medicine. I've always kind of like referred to some of the some of the little tidbits, and I I totally agree with you that that the environment affects us hugely, and uh, and it, yeah. we have to. We have to feed our dogs and treat our dogs according to where they are and what what time of the yes. year it is as well. That's for yep. sure. Yep. Yep. Changes seasonally, change with location. I mean, I moved from New Jersey to North Carolina. The difference, the, the, they both have four seasons, sort of, uh, but it is different. It, we don't get as cold in the winter. We don't mm. get heaps of snow. Mm. Uh, it, the hot, humid definitely lasts a lot longer down here. So, you know, I have to look at feeding my dogs a little bit differently than I did before so that we can avoid some of those problems. Um and just kind of maintaining things a little differently. So anyway, Peter, thank you so much <laughs> for agreeing to come on because you, you do. And I remember talking to you, it was probably a few years ago now. Um, and we kind of had a discussion about allergies and you brought up the spinal misalignment then. Um, and it's so easy to forget it. And, and I think the hardest thing for our listeners is that not everybody has access to a veterinarian or a chiropractor who can work on their dogs, but you know, it might be that they do and it's never been looked at as mm -hmm. a potential cause to what they're seeing. So hopefully this will maybe spark a little something that people can say, Ooh, you're right. He is chewing on the same spot all the time, mm -hmm. or it does, mm -hmm. you know, occur in the lumbar area or whatever's going on and maybe look at that in addition and maybe it can help kind of be that one extra step that just gets them over the hump we just have to you know there's so many different uh different sides of medicine and healing and 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 this is why i love actually talking to you and my other colleagues even though i feel like i'm not doing it enough because life gets busy <laughs> life gets busy but it just really it just really makes me feel good to learn from you and learn from others it's yeah, it's awesome. We should do it more often. I hope we will. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. I, I'd love end. to have you. I'd love to have you on my side as well, and maybe we can we can talk. We can we can continue this discussion. Sounds great. great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. To everyone who's been listening, hopefully this has been helpful, and uh, we'll see you on the next show. <laughs>